This is Philosophy Takes on the News. Hello and welcome to Philosophy Takes on the News. We were away last week, or at least I was, but we're back again for another slice of philosophy-influenced chat about the headlines. I'm Simon Kirchin, a philosopher based at the University of Kent. We're recording on the morning of Friday the 10th of March 2023. This is the week that saw the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak propose a new policy regarding asylum seekers and migrants crossing English Channel to get to the UK. Russia's invasion of Ukraine continued with blackouts across Ukraine and it was International Women's Day. So this week we're going to think about what exactly is in the public interest, what place there is for religious views in the public political sphere and we'll be thinking about the amount of hate directed towards minorities at present. And we'll also see what else we get on to as always. We're now into our third series or season of PTOTN Uh, The news continues to depress with stories of sadness and darkness never far from view. The basest of actors are on the world stage and the worst of humankind is on display. Which, of course, brings me to this week's guests. Joining me today, (laughs) we have Julie Bagini, author and broadcaster, whose latest book is called How to Think Like a Philosopher. Hi, Julian. Uh, Hi, Simon. Lovely introduction. Uh, and Sophie Grace Chapel, Professor of Philosophy at the Open University. Hello, Simon. I recognise. I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue reference. <laughs> uh, they borrowed it from me, of course. <laughs> um, great to have both of you with us. OK, so let's get to our first item. In the past week, journalist Isabel Oakshot has released a whole cache of private WhatsApp messages that were passed to her by Matt Hancock from when they were writing a book together last year. Matt Hancock is a past UK health secretary, and the messages relate to the time of the COVID pandemic. They show ministers, advisors and civil servants discussing what to do during the pandemic and what policies to create and enforce. It's fair to say that not everyone comes out of these messages with much dignity. Oakshots defended the release of the messages as being in the public interest, and that attracts my attention, not just in this example, but of course, many examples. Currently, we might also think about the US and Tucker Carlson and Donald J. Trump. Um, Is the release of these private messages in the public interest? What might we think of as being in the public interest, passing at his hands various legal and moral thresholds? Uh, Sophie Grace, do you want to kick things off for us? Well, I think the form of the argument that Isabel Oakeshott is putting up is a reputable form of argument. So the argument is there's a rule, there's a presumption, about protecting privacy, and that presumption can be overridden by an overriding public interest. Now, um, that's the form of the argument. I think the form is fine. Whether the instance is fine, I have my doubts about. Obviously, just to say in response to this, look, if if people um, can't communicate privately whilst being involved in the business of government, then government can't go on at all. Obviously, that's true, but doesn't in any way get us past the form of the argument, because the whole point is there's this rule that there can be exceptions to. Um, But in this case, well, I think it becomes relevant to ask what are Isabel Oakeshott's motives? Um, And here's a parallel. I think another argument which has a rather similar form in some ways is about the right to secession. Question, does a sub-state or a unit of a state like the Confederacy and the American Civil War have the right to secede? Answer, um, well, on the whole, it's better if states don't secede and states couldn't get on if states if substates were seceding all the time. But yes, there is such a right. However, when can it be exercised as a kind of overriding of the normal procedure? Um, that depends on when the motives are good and when the reasons why you're seceding are, rece- are respectable. In the case of the Confederacy, I don't think the motives were respectable at all. It was to protect slavery and keep that going. In Isabel Oakeshott's case, I think it's very clear that she, I mean, just from her track record on Twitter and elsewhere, it's very clear that she has a kind of COVID denial and lockdown denial motivation behind what she's doing. And so I think for that reason that her uh, justification fails because her motive is not good enough to show that there is an exception in the public interest here. Okay, thank you. Interesting thoughts. Julian, any thoughts from you? 
Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure motivation is the, the key factor, and perhaps perhaps we'll come back to that because, I mean, the the law is actually quite uh, complicated when it comes around to this. And there was an act of parliament. I'm sorry, I don't can't cite you the name in the year in the late 1990s, which was uh, addressed to making protecting whistleblowers basically. And so this is really around the idea of public disclosure. And yes, there was a public interest test. That was one of the main things. There was also a kind of a test whereby, uh, you know, it wasn't okay simply to put everything out into the public domain as a first resort. It had to be a kind of a last resort. So in order to be defended in law, it had to be shown that you had exhausted other ways of getting this information to the right people. And that's what worries me in this case. Again, I don't really I want to speak with any great confidence about this case, but it seems to me there was an investigation going on. Um, Oakshot could have given these documents to the, the relevant investigators, and, and that would, I think, have been the, the right way to do it if there was a genuine public interest. But the reason I'm not quite sure about um, motivations is, I mean, let's say the government was doing something truly awful and, you know, that was clearly in the public interest for people to know, and that some civil servant got hold of this, and their motivation to leak it was that they were going to become famous and be able to write a huge book about it and go and Oprah Winfrey. I mean, I think that would still be right that they did it. It wouldn't reflect well on them, of course. You know, our judgment of them as an individual wouldn't be, oh, you're a great saviour, you're a wonderful human being. It'd be, well, you're a self-seeking publicist who, who just by chance happened to be able to publicise yourself by disclosing your motives. So, right, um, so I think we're right to, to judge Oakshot badly on, on her intentions, but I don't think yeah. that's the way we should judge the actual rightness or wrongness of... I, yeah, I, I think we, we, we don't have a deep disagreement here, Julian, Good. because I think um, I can agree with you that there's a checklist of other me measures that you should go through first before you decide to whistleblow. And I, I just agree with you on that point, and that's correct. Again, with the secession analogy, there's a checklist of things that a substate should do before it decides that it has to secede because it can't get what it's after in any other way. Um, and I agree with you, too, that there's a distinction between the justifiability of the act and the justifiability of the act as performed by this agent who does it now. There certainly is that distinction. But um, I, I think I stick to my guns in saying that this piece of whistleblowing is justified neither um, by the act in itself nor by Oakshot's motives. I and mean, of course, you, you could have terrible motives for doing the right thing. Certainly you could. And contrary to Thomas a. Beckett in um, in the Elliot play, I don't think it's the deepest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Not by a long way. There are much deeper treasons than that. But in this case, I think Isabel Oakshot's motive is probably, I mean, I can't speculate on her psychology, but at a guess from what I've seen, it was rather tawdry affair. I'd say it's to do with getting a dig in at Matt Hancock and it's to do with advancing her career. And those aren't terribly respectable motives. So the action as done by her, I think, doesn't, doesn't stand up to examination. But then the action as done in itself, I'm, I'm sounding like a Thomist here, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, the action as done in itself um, I, I think is dubious too, because what she really wants to demonstrate, I think, is that the lockdown was not justified. And I think that's not only false, but pernicious. I think the lockdown was most certainly justified. And I think what she's doing in attacking the lockdown by this route is damaging to public trust, to public confidence in medicine, in government, and in ju just the way we behave as a society. Um, and of course, trust in those things has been massively undermined already by revelations about um, the ineffable Boris Johnson, for a start. But I think what Isabel Oakeshott is doing is, is bad in itself, because it's attack, an attack on the idea of coordinating society around a lockdown, which I think was something we clearly had to do. I mean, yeah, I still agree with all of that. Yeah, and uh, the, the the Thomism is perfectly acceptable in these occasions. Uh, but the the public interest defence. I mean, it sounds like we're both not persuaded by that, but it's worth going into a bit because, um, I mean, one way in which I think she sort of shoots herself in the foot about this is by releasing literally everything. <laughs> I mean, the point is there are certain things that were revealed which some people may think are in the public interest, but the idea that every single message was in the public interest seems very, very uh, dubious. And I think that, so, so some of the things, actually I have a, a nice little discussion, philosophy discussion group. It's kind of like philosophy takes on the news, but with um, normal people rather than strange philosophers in, in, in a room. And, uh, we I'm a normal person too sometimes, Julian. Yeah, 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 I know. I know. Sometimes. Uh, 
um, and 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 yeah, I mean, a lot of people felt. Some of the people felt there that it was in the public interest for people to know what these leaders really thought of them, if you like. So there were like you know teachers and sort of nurses saying, you know, this Hancock was revealing what he really thought of people, and it's in the interest of those people to know that. And although I can see that was persuasive, in well, I can see why people find that persuasive. Again, I'm not really sure. I, th- I think it's quite important that people have the space to be able to talk bluntly and perhaps unguardedly and perhaps inadvisedly, you know. Absolutely. So, for example, you know, I might if, – if you're manager of a company, for example, there have got to be occasions where you say to somebody at home on the golf course like, something that you, you, you shouldn't say to a person or to their colleague, like they're a complete waste of space, are oh, they drive me mad, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea that if someone were to be able to record that, then yeah. they'd be right to pass it on. That seems totally, totally wrong. And so yeah. I think it's politicians, it's tempting to think that we have a right to see into their inner souls and to sort of like hear every thought they have about us. And I don't think that's true. And I think if that were the case, it would be even more difficult to be a politician than it is. And we've seen a few high-profile politicians you know, quit under the pressure as well. This is one of, yeah. one of those pressures. Well, we're, we're going to disappoint Simon deeply by, um, I, I completely agree, disagree. Sorry, I completely agree with you, yeah. Julian. <laughs> So we're going to fail to disagree here completely. I I totally agree. I think it's very important that it should be possible for people to have private conversations and to let off steam. And I also think, I mean, I'd actually go further than you're going, um, perhaps. I I think this is actually the the media bait. I think this is how, um, this is what what people are supposed to do in reacting to all these revelations is uh, fasten on the fact that Matt Hancock said in these messages um, to I forget which other secret, which other cabinet minister it was. He said in a message, um, "God, these teachers hate working, don't they?" Or words to that effect, which is a deeply reprehensible and, and stupid thing to say, and also utterly hypocritical, coming from Matt Hancock, um, who was never noted for his work rate. I and mean, it'd be even worse if it was Dominic Raab saying this, you know, given, given the famous lying on the beach whilst some absolute shitstorm goes down elsewhere. But people should have the right to say that kind of thing. People shouldn't fall for it here. People are going to say, well, that's scandalous. It's awful that he said that. And I'm offended that he said that. But he did say it in a context where he could reasonably expect privacy. And a parallel here, I think, some time ago, is Gordon Brown's famous um, bigoted woman remark. Gordon Brown said that when he was in his ministerial car, having just been glad handing crowd before, I think it was the 2010 election, wasn't it? And unfortunately for him, his mic was still on. And a journalist took advantage of the fact that he left his mic on and these words went public and Gordon Brown had to eat a lot of humble pie. And I think it was utterly illegitimate for the broadcaster, which I think was Sky News, to use that against Gordon Brown. I think that was a breach of the kind of trust that there should be between journalists and politicians. They should have let him say that and get away with it. He said it in a context where he was off stage. And it's you know you, you don't judge a performance of King Lear by... Um, looking at the actor behind the screen, be, be behind the stage, you know, clambering into the next costume. You don't judge him on the colour of his underpants while he's doing that. And this was similarly unfair, I thought. Because I was going to say, I mean, it'd be, it'd be a bit like, let's say this recording, you know, Simon said, uh, I'm stopping the recording now. And then immediately, you know, Sophie Gray says, oh, Julian, you've been such a tit, right? <laughs> now, I mean, uh, you yeah, know, Simon wouldn't be justified in using that in, in the recording, not without our permission, anyway. But listen, so we, I, I don't know, because we have been agreeing quite a lot, and Simon's been very respectful. I, I, used, I used to have a colleague who, he would <clears throat> he would give two lectures in the morning, and then he would dash into the loo, and he was clearly desperate for a wee, that was one thing. And if, if you happen to be in one of the cubicles while he was doing this, he'd stand there um, at the urinal, leaning his head on the wall, and... Uh, and either peeing or waiting to pee, and you could hear him saying, fucking students, fucking lectures, <laughs> fucking <laughs> And this was well known in the department, and this was extremely funny. But no one ever talked about it, you know, except to each other. We certainly wouldn't have recorded this guy and broadcast him to the students. That would have been deeply unfair. It was just a private joke, and something should stay private. And I believe I'm the only person who's ever spoken in public about that, and I'm not saying which university or who it was. Uh, thank you both. You write some thoughts for me. Just, just uh, I'm caught. The, the thing that keeps on going around in my head is the thing that Julian said a, a few minutes ago about... Um, uh, people on the golf course. I'm just thinking about you know all the university philosophers that I go golfing with and all the things, <laughs> like that. Uh, which of course, of course I course you do. So broadly, I, I mean, I agree with with the the two of you. I mean, frankly, 
uh, and let's be frank, just to make it explicit and then put it aside, Isabel Oakeshott comes out of this as being like an incredibly vile person from what I can see. Uh, I don't know much about her at all. Now I know something about her. I think she's vile in public. There we are. Um, so put that aside. I think <laughs> that the, the, the um, if you can, the, the, the thing, the defence that she's made, of course, and we mentioned this a, a little while ago, is that there is, of course, a public inquiry going on at the moment. And I believe that these WhatsApp messages have been passed to that public inquiry. It's just that Isabel Oakeshott thought there might be a cover-up, it would take too long, and so she's going to put them all out there. But, I mean, most of this stuff is just dross. I mean, in, in preparation for this, I've actually had to read some of this material. I mean, it's just awful. I mean, as I said, the, the, the two of you, when we were preparing for this, I mean, basically you find out that 90% of it is that ministers don't like other ministers. They don't like some civil servants. They don't like 90% of the population. They sound off about it in quite a chaotic, stressful situation. Well, what a surprise, right? And, and as you both say, people, all people should, should have, including politicians, should have the um, space to be talking off stage without fear of, of this, this coming out. There are one or two things that I think are interesting here. But my view is I don't think that they, they pass the threshold to justify com this coming out now on the, in the Telegraph and Isabel Oakeshott earning some money for it all and publicity. And really it should be for public inquiry to, to sort its way through all of this material and many other material and try to put it all in a in a context, which is absolutely crucial with WhatsApp messages. But anyway, uh, Julian, you come back in first. Yeah, then. okay. Well, well, let's see if this, this consensus is actually as strong as, as it seems so far, because I've just remembered the Donald Trump incident where he was recorded in a private context, locker room banter, as it was called, about, you know, the famous pussy grabbing thing. And a lot of people, um, including myself, I think felt instinctively it was right that that information got out. Because why? Because in the public interest to know what kind of man this was. But I'm slightly worried that, you know, we... The similar argument that we need to know what kind of person Matt Hancock was, we were saying, well, no, because people speak unguardedly in private moments. That When that defence was used of Donald Trump, people like myself thought it was weak. So am I applying double standards or is the public interest case different? I, I think the difference is that uh, there's no presupposition of confidentiality. I mean, yes, he's, talk, he's, he's engaging in vile locker room talk in a context where he doesn't expect his words to get out, but the, the, they're not ministers. It, it wasn't a discussion between ministers making policy where I think there is a reasonable presumption that you've got a right to keep things confidential. So I, I don't think the argument applies there. And I, I think also the consideration that we need to know what kind of man this is. I think that's important. I think um, it shows something very important about Trump that he cheats at golf. I think it shows something very important about Stanley Johnson, that he is, um, there's very good evidence that he has been a wife abuser, that he broke his first wife's nose. I think that makes him, um, well, I think it makes him an unfit person to be on most public platforms, actually. He certainly shouldn't be getting a knighthood um, or a peerage or whatever it is he's being offered. But as I say, I think the crucial thing here is is two things. First of all, there's a stronger case for saying that even if there was a confidentiality uh, presupposition that gets overridden. I mean, if, if someone, you know, propositioned someone in a private minister's message, if one minister was sexually harassing another in private minister's messages, then the presupposition of confidentiality would be overridden. That's one point. And the other point is that I think these are cases where there's less of that, a less strong presupposition that you have the right to privacy. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it seems like, you know, it'd be nice to have a straightforward principle but what we've got is it seems we've got a, a list of considerations and they each have kind of thresholds and that, you know, you have to kind of, and you can go above the threshold in any particular one, you know, the public interest becomes so overwhelming or, you know, uh, that it's allowed through. So it is a very much a case by case thing, but I suppose the concerning thing about that is that because we do incline to like confirmation bias and think about things the way we are, it, it's very easy to sort of, um, jump on the justifications that suit the way we want it to be. So it's actually quite hard to think them through in a way which is genuinely fair. And the, the current social media environment, it doesn't make that very easy, does it? Because when you, That's right. if you hear about this being discussed, you <laughs> tend to have everyone piling in on the side that they, they, they want. So that's yeah. why we need this podcast, Simon, so we can talk about that's these right. things in a measured, calm way. 
I mean, there's, there's an interesting kind of uh, different element that I just wanted to raise to you. I don't know whether it's philosophical. I just think it's very interesting. So I read something, and apologies, I didn't send this to the two of you to in, in preparation for this, but I read something this morning. Um, uh, I think it's from the Information Commissioner's Office, um, just reflecting on these this WhatsApp leak and just the use, uh, the increased uh, and prevalent use of WhatsApp messages and other technologies out to make decisions or to create an atmosphere in which decisions are then made and momentum is created, aside from typical committees, right, in Whitehall, but presumably this is this is true of, of other governments as well. And so there's, you know, this this phrase that's been used in relation to, to this uh, release, policy on the hoof, but of course that, again, applies in many cases. And there's something very interesting there about... Um, you know, what information is useful and what information is actually um, going into this decision making process where formal decisions might be made on a committee. But in a way, you've already made the decision or certainly created a lot of momentum in a kind of group of WhatsApp messages that's, you know, just got five, six, seven people involved. And I think that's just a very interesting thing that that's how government is being made now and, and decision making even not formally, there's a massive amount of momentum there rather than, I mean, there's always been this case, right? Even if you just had, you know, in olden times, just all committee meetings, there'd always be the discussion before you got to the committee meeting, right? In corridors or cloisters or wherever it would be. But I think there's just something interesting and now all this stuff is recorded in a WhatsApp message and has the possibility of being released. And I just think that's just an interesting change. One of my favourite books about the sociology of government is Parkinson's Law, which um, I don't know if people still know the book, Parkinson's Law. It's a wonderful book, and there's much more to it than the famous adage about work expanding to fill the time available, which I've always thought optimistic, incidentally. Um, but one of the things it talks about is how if you track through the history of um, the what is now the Cabinet, there were lots and lots of predecessor bodies to the Cabinet and there was the the Privy Council at one stage. There was the the, the Court of um, Star Chamber or something. There were various names for this group, which was supposed to be the little group of advisors to the monarch in its original form. And what's clearly happened is that each time, I mean, it's actually there implicit in the name of the cabinet. A cabinet is a small room off the main room. So before you go into the main committee and say what you think should happen and debate it in public. You have this private debate off in a corner in the cabinet, and it's the results of that that determine what you say in the larger parliament or other chamber that it may be. And we see this pattern of, you know, it's, it's obviously because the requirements of being able to say something that is uh, not minuted. There's the imperative to minute things so that people know what's going on. There's the imperative not to minute things so that people don't know what's going on. And so that those who are in the inner circle can get one over on those who aren't. And this is happening. This is precisely what's happening with WhatsApp. And I think one consequence of this tendency is um, that it's bad for government, which is bad for public deliberation, um, that people know that if they say something unguarded or risky, then it will get out and they'll get in trouble for saying it. And so things go off the record. And because they're off the record, they're less well thought out, less well clear, um, probably not written down at all. And it's not a recipe for good government. Um, so there is a kind of real consequentialist worry here about what happens if we keep penalising things, uh, that are said, which are unguarded. Yeah. And also the, the lack of tolerance for like contemplating all options, even if on the face of it they seem, seem awful. So if I were in the government at the time of the pandemic broke, then I think I would expect someone to ask the question, what if we just let it rip through the population? Right now, I think that when you think about that, you know, you do kind of come to the conclusion pretty quickly. No, no. But the, of course, you should consider it because, um, you know, you can't rule out in advance that that actually might in the long run be the better thing. Um, so you know, if everything's being recorded, no one can even raise that possibility. And there may be times where actually something which on the face of it sounds like a really bad idea actually turns out to be the best one. Yeah, will you excuse me? I've got to go and ring the Daily Mail about the genius <laughs> shock suggestion about how to deal with the pandemic. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, the, the, I think there are, you know, this is a famous subject that philosophers have often discussed. What 
items should we, what options should we be deliberating between is something I've written on. And I think it's a very interesting question because clearly there's a famous quotation of Bernard Williams where Williams says, um, look, there are clearly some options which should not be on the menu for deliberation. Mm. So you're trying to decide what to do about a business rival. And, and one of the people in the committee meeting says, why don't we just shoot them? <laughs> That's a better not even get onto the, the menu. But yeah. It's it's not you know we're often advised to think the unthinkable and often it is a good idea to think about crazy alternatives just to see if actually you know maybe taking that route would produce something good. Yeah, I mean of course, and what's interesting going back to Isabel Oakeshott is that she's a lockdown skeptic, and I don't know exactly. I mean, it's not as if I followed her uh, her writing career at all, but I don't know exactly what she said and, and how skeptical she is. Um, but clearly there were some people at the time and, and nowadays that think there shouldn't have been any lockdowns at all. Um, and so that's that's the equivalent of, of um, Julian saying, well, let's just let it rip through the population. Let's just not, I mean, might control in some way, but we're not going to have any lockdowns. Well, then you do need to perhaps think about that in an unguarded moment and then think, oh, my goodness, but then that means this all of this stuff's going to happen. And clearly there have been some problems, but, you know, we've had lockdowns. Have there been some downsides to them? Well, obviously, right? I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, students I'm, I'm teaching now and, and uh, kids at my school. That's that's how it has quite a lot, lot of effect on, on the young population and, and many other people as well. We could, we could go through it. So it's, it's not that I, I think there are nations where there's clearly been too much lockdown and nations where there's clearly been too little. Um, in the former category, I think New Zealand. New Zealand locked down very hard and very long. And I, I think arguably too hard and too long. And certainly a lot of New Zealanders think that. And Sweden didn't lock down hard enough. That's fairly evident. And uh, when, when this whole business started in 2020, my reaction was to think, to, to ask precisely Julian's question, you know, should we actually lock down? Is that what we should do? And I read up on the science. And as I understand it, the science is you can't stop this um, virus ripping through society, but you can affect the rate at which it goes. And the rate at which it goes is crucial because for the NHS to avoid being overwhelmed, we need, um, so to speak, the metaphor of a plane landing, you need a slow glide in. So you need cases to keep coming, but not at an um, impossible volume. And what you don't want to do is nose dive into the tarmac. So, and that is what will happen if you don't lock down. So that was the argument for lockdown. And I think it's basically correct. But there are degrees and ways of doing it. And of course, one big thing about a lockdown is that it's absolutely crucial that the political leaders should toe the line themselves and should set a good example. And in that respect, I think uh, the UK failed abominably, absolutely abominably. I think it's obvious how badly we failed in that respect. That's right. And for more information on that, uh, please listen to previous Philosophy Takes on the News episodes where we have a succession of different people moaning about Boris Johnson and others. Um, Should we leave that discussion there? Uh, Thanks, both of you. Uh, We'll see you in the next part where we will be thinking about religion in public life. And welcome back. The Scottish National Party is currently choosing a new leader who will also become First Minister of Scotland. Kate Forbes, one of the three candidates, has come under intense pressure recently for expressing political views that are explicit reflections of her religious views. We can talk about those views themselves, of course, but what really attracts me to this story is the tie between religious views and political views. Uh, Forbes isn't the first politician to be placed in this position. In fact, we have discussed this topic before on Philosophy Takes on the News, but always good to talk about it again with different people. So uh, does anyone have any views about how much religious views can and should be allowed to influence political stances and policy? Julian, why don't you go first? Well, I think it's an interesting one because there's there's a certain sort of narrative which comes through, which is that... uh, sort of liberal secularists are sort of demanding that religious people are not entitled to their opinions, they have to keep them totally secret, and that they have to sort of deny their their fundamental values in order to be in public life. And this is an unfair and asymmetric demand. And I don't think that is true. So let's sort of be clear about what I think the limitations are. And it's not actually about religion anyway. So this comes from there are arguments with something in John Rawls and similar ones in Jürgen Habermas. It's about this, the space of public reason. So we live in a democratic society where there are a plurality of values, and that is the basic fact. And you know, what is the goal of politics? The goal of politics is to reach as much agreement between people as possible. 
And we know that people in these societies have different fundamental moral positions and worldviews. So the idea is that when we're negotiating in the public space, we're not going to get anywhere if we bring to the table things which are very tightly um, justified by our own private views. So if we're having a debate about abortion, for example, and somebody says, well, you know, we can't have abortion. I'm a Roman Catholic. It's a sin. The, the discussion there can't even get going because, you know, Roman Catholics are about 7% of the population, whatever it might be. Even if they were 50% or 60%, to be honest, you still live in a pluralist society with other people. So you've got to kind of bring – the arguments you've got to use have got to be ones that have some chance or have some purchase with people irrespective of their more fundamental positions. And I think that's just necessary. And it's not a particular – but it's not a particular limitation on religious people. It's a limitation on everyone. So, for example, if I'm an atheist, I can't say, well, look, you know, uh, we should certainly allow abortion because um, there's no God and it's all down to us and we can just do what we want or something. You know, not, m- most atheists have a more complicated morality than that, by the way. But, you know, it, it's not just about whether you're religious or not. It's whether or not you're justifying your position on the basis of a very, very particular worldview, which is you can't expect to be shared. Well, there are lots of values we do share about, you know, autonomy, liberty, sanctity of life. So that is the limitation. And I think that's absolutely fine. In the case of, say, the same-sex marriage point of view, um, in, in this case, if you're against it for religious reasons, that what you're not supposed to be doing is to stand up and argue against it on religious reasons. But you can argue against it. And I don't think you also have to hide the fact that you have those religious motivations, just that those are not the reasons you bring to the table. So in this particular case, I think the point is it is significant to know what this person's views are, not because we need to know about their private views or et cetera, et cetera, but because actually this is going to affect the way they're going to vote in, <laughs> on an issue, which is of importance. And, and that's that. Uh, and that's why it's important. So she's not being persecuted for her religious beliefs, for being religious. Um, people are making negative judgments because the beliefs that she has led to on that are going to have consequences and people are going to vote on them. And of course, we need to know how people are going to vote. And so there's another, I'm I'm really bad with names, I can never remember names. The other candidate, another candidate for this election, Sophie Grace knows this, uh, is a Muslim, yeah? Yes, Hamza Yusuf. Right. He has said very clearly, and I I don't care what his, maybe his religious views are that same-sex relationships are sinful. I don't know, maybe he does, right? But he's very clear that in, as far as politics is concerned, is that's, that's got nothing to do with it. And he has voted to allow them and to be supportive of them, et cetera, et cetera. So that's fine. So, again, he's entitled to his religious views. No one's saying he can't have them. But if, if he's going to vote in a certain way, then uh, we need to know. And uh, we judge them on that basis. And whether they're religiously motivated or not is besides the point. So I think I think people basically confuse a lot of different things here. They think it's about not allowing people to have their religious views when it's nothing to do with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a number of points on this. First of all, on the, the broad issue, I'm sympathetic myself to a kind of Habermasian or, or Rawlsian um, dialogical view of public civic rationality. I, I think it's, I, I do think it is in a certain sense, the only game in town. It is how we should talk about our disagreements. Um, exactly how to articulate that conception of public reason, I think, is a very difficult question in a number of ways. One thing that happens um, amongst the theorists is that theorists distinguish between um, ideal conceptions of public deliberators and actual deliberators. And they say, oh, we, we couldn't possibly go with talking about the actual deliberators because everyone knows that lots of actual deliberators are are really very unreasonable. So we have to idealise them. Um, and that, that, I think, leads us to an uninteresting circularity. It gets to be an abstract debate amongst idealised reasoners who, well, well, of course, they agree, they agree with each other. They're, they're idealised reasoners. So you go the other way. You go with actual reasoners, and then things get messy and complicated. And you see at once why people wanted to idealise, because you're having to deal with, say, a society like contemporary Afghanistan or Florence in the 14th century, think about public reason in a place like that. There certainly can be a conception of public reason, but what's taken for granted there is very different from what we take for granted. Um, Then you think about our society and the things, and there's there's a big battle 
of course, in our public society, in our public discussions about what we should take for granted. A lot of people want it to be taken for granted, for example, that the idea of unlimited immigration to this country from, say, Afghanistan again, is a massive problem. And I don't think we should take that for granted. It's a long story about why not. But this is a question about who are the who are the actors in public reason? Who are the reasoners? That question keeps coming back. And of course, we all know there have been lots of conceptions of public reason in the past. Aristotle's, um, the West's until the 20th century, Afghanistan's today, for a lot of Afghans, where women are not part of public reasoning. And that's very problematic. So there's a lot to say about how our conception of public reason should go and what should be included and what should be excluded as factors that we just take for granted. Um, And in Afghanistan today, I think for most people in Afghanistan, Islam is taken for granted as a presupposition. So it's not like religion can't be in the public sphere, provided everyone agrees on it. And then, of course, you get the problem that there's tiny minorities in Afghanistan who don't. Then on the Kate Forbes issue, um, I'll say two things. First of all, why is it always... Why, why do they always do this trick? The people who have the views that might be unkindly described as bigoted, why do they always do this trick of making themselves out to be the victim? Um, I really do find that very irritating and quite objectionable, that they're the ones who are the victims because they have these, um, to, to my mind, quite pernicious views um, and, and also unchristian views. I, I don't think, I don't like this tendency that people like Kate Forbes have to say this is the Christian view. The Christian view? on homosexuality and transgenderism, for example, um, there isn't a Christian view. There is a variety of Christian views. And I'm, I'm a transgender person. I have a different view. Of, and I'm a Christian. And I have a different view than Kate Forbes. And then on the, the question of how it affects Kate Forbes as a politician, I think this is, is very important, actually. First of all, there are other politicians leading the SNP who also have similar views to Kate Forbes. Ian Blackford is a member of the very same church as Kate Forbes. And that hasn't been a problem for him in standing up for um, LGBTQ rights at all. Hamza Youssef, I believe, has had some run-ins with his imam about his liberalism. But Hamza Youssef stands up and he says, you know, I'm going to defend these rights. Um, So it's not impossible to have religious views. And as you say, Julian, reflect them or in a more nuanced way or perhaps not reflect them at all. Joe Biden is another case of the same point. Um, He's he's a, a, a pious Catholic. But he stands at the head of a regime which is pro-abortion and pro-trans rights and pro-gay rights. Now, on the specific issue of this leadership contest, it's not just the case that Kate Forbes' views might in the future affect her policy. It's the case that her views are already affecting her policy, because the biggest conflict between Holyrood and Westminster at the moment is about the Section 35 on the Gender Recognition Reform Act, which Holyrood is trying to pass and which... Westminster has um, vetoed by a section 35. Now, I'm afraid I do not believe for a minute that if what had happened was that Holyrood had drawn up a budget and Alistair Jack had stepped in with a section 35, I do not believe for a minute that Ash Regan and Kate Forbes would have said, we're not going to fight this battle. They stepped back from that battle, and I think it's a crucial one as an SNP supporter, and it's a crucial battle for the SNP to fight, they step back from that battle pretty clearly because they don't hold with self-ID. And that is not the issue here. The issue is whether Holyrood has the right to pass refer- uh, to, to pass legislation of its own. And they've stepped back from that fight because of their personal opinions. And that, I think, is already their personal opinions getting in the way of them doing what they should do. I mean, in a sense, in a sense the key point is, is not it's not whether or not you agree or disagree with what particular policies they're beliefs are taking them to the point is that they are having an effect on them right i think the key point is simply that because uh, their political actions are going to be affected by their religious beliefs you need to know how they're going to be affected in order to to judge whether or not you think that's a thing to support them or not actually it goes back a bit more say about motivations as well because i mean let's say for example i'm in favor of which i am in favor of of uh, legislation which improves the welfare of, of farmed animals. Right now, it could it could be that someone um, is is keen to support that for religious views that I completely don't hold and are part of a package of other religious beliefs that I don't hold. Uh, but it turns out that you know on other issues where I might disagree 
it doesn't affect their voting. On this one, it does. So the fact that their motivation is religious, but they are going to support it. What I need to know the point is the point about politics is that you never want to, you never have to achieve a perfect alignment of of motivation and policy and everything. You, you support the people who are basically going to do the things you want to do. So if the motivation is the wrong one, but it's for the right policy. I'll go with it. But you just need to know what it is. That's the point. It's the point is that it is in the public interest to know about that. And to say, you know, that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm being persecuted for my religious belief because, you know, people people demand to know what my religious beliefs are and are punishing for it. Well, I'm punishing you for it because uh, I don't agree with it. You know, other policies, I mean, you know, I think far more <laughs> uh, uncontroversial Christian policies would be around, you know, uh, so- social justice and kindness to the poor and all that kind of stuff. You know, if she turns around and says, I'm going to support uh, increasing, uh, you know, universal benefit because Jesus said he has two coats, gives to one, has one, I would say, yeah, good for you. Excellent. I, I, I'm, I, I, su- I support you there. So, you know, it's, it's it's not about leaping on people because they're religious belief. It's leaping on people because the the beliefs that they think follow from that are going to have political consequences. And we don't like them. Yeah, absolutely. Debt cancellation now. It's mm. it's right there. It's it's in Leviticus. It's in Isaiah. It's in the Gospels. We must have complete debt cancellation every seven years because that's what. Um, it says in the book of Leviticus. And yeah, please don't quote Leviticus. We don't want to go down Leviticus. Leviticus quotes a lot of things I think no. you'd find pretty <laughs> abhorrent. Sure. I mean, you know, there's the famous God hates shrimp site about how if you're going to if you're going to dump on gay people and trans people because of Leviticus, then why aren't you dumping on people who eat crustaceans? Because that's condemned in Leviticus too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think one question that's interesting um, in this broad area is the question: What is a religious belief? And one thing that often surprises philosophers when they talk to their colleagues in religious studies is that actually religious studies people do not have a definition of religion and do not want a definition of religion. They they think, you know, obviously there are beliefs which go, which are existentially deep for you, which are um, beliefs about uh, what's basic in the world of value. Um, they But they don't have a clear distinction of beliefs. They can't partition beliefs into religious and non-religious in any neat way. And I think that's healthy, actually. I don't think there is a clear partition there. Yeah, and in fact, just some thoughts from from me. Uh, I mean, I was going to use the example of vegetarianism because there was, oh, now I forget the name, but there was a controversial appointment, wasn't there, of someone to be a farming minister, but was a vegetarian. Farmers worried about this, but actually turned out to be a very good, very good appointment. And in fact, you know, there might be a whole host of beliefs which you might describe as broadly ethical. Um, where their beliefs will be affecting their their politics. And actually, if you turn it around, I mean, we we don't want to just be electing people who have no views. <laughs> I mean, people get into politics because they have views. I mean, that's what we want. We don't want people getting into politics because of, you know, just personal advancement. We want people to get into politics because they want to change things. Now, of course, we might disagree about how they want to change things, but that's politics. And then you get into voting and and so on, right? Um, so I think it goes back to Julian's thought that we just need to know what your views are, religious or otherwise. So then we can make it, and then then you might say other things around them, such as, you know, th- this may or may not affect my my voting, uh, my possible voting uh, record in the future because I believe this very strongly, or I'm inclined towards this, but blah blah blah. And they, you know, diff- different qualifiers around that, and then you make your judgment about whether you want to vote for them or what you think of them in in office, right? Uh, I mean, that's that's the, got to be the the key thing. Um, and as, as you're right, Sophie Grace, you know, talking to quite a, quite recently, I've been talking to quite a few religious studies teachers at school, and there's this whole discussion about what religious studies, uh, well, as opposed to religious education, is right. Religious education is just finding out what Christians or Muslims believe and what, how they practice. Religious studies is a is a more amorphous kind of kind of educational remit, really, at school level. Uh, and there's kind of lots of thought about what actually should be part of a typical religious studies curriculum. And in many schools, actually, uh, a lot of what's in the religious studies curriculum is straightforward ethical debates about vegetarianism and about war and peace. And one thing that Wittgenstein says that I think is useful is in the lectures on religious belief, he says um, the point about the re- the resurrection for a believer. I mean, you know, someone someone might might believe that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead, and this have no significance for them. I say, yeah, he rose from the dead. So what? 
Um, it's just another fact about the ancient world for him. And for him, that's not a religious belief. And Wittgenstein says the point about religious beliefs is you give them a completely different place in your life. And then I'm, I'm not clear what the limits are on what can then count as a religious belief. You know, maybe I, maybe I think that cabbages are really tiny little Martians sitting in their trenches surveilling us. And if I give that belief a particular place in my life, perhaps that's a religious belief. Mm. Yeah, the idea of the name David Icke comes to mind at this point. <laughs> yes, well, I, I think the beliefs that you get amongst conspiracy theorists and cultists of various kinds are, in many cases, properly describable on the Wittgenstein test as being very like, or actually, religious beliefs. Because um, obviously it's a matter of degree what place you give a belief in your life, but that's a useful feature because it shows how um, there are grey areas about whether something counts as a religious belief. Yeah, certainly my colleagues in religious studies here at Kent, uh, I think they, they still do it. They certainly used to run a, a module, a big module for like the first years or the second years called Religion, Sects and Cults. I'm trying to work out what the difference is between them. <laughs> Pick any two of the above. Yeah. I mean, I mean, then to, 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 I mean, you can think about particular what are seen as political views uh, and you can look at the extremes on the right or the extremes on the left at the moment, and you say that you know it's a it's a commonplace that these are held with quasi religious fervor, um, and that, you know people I've seen quite recently people refer to kind of Brexit theology, uh, um, but you can say similar things about people who hold kind of fairly far left views as well, um, and there's there's you know huge amounts of parallels here. Um, uh, uh, Julian, any last thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is all tr true, although I'm always wary of making too much of, of grey areas because they're, all, they're always grey areas, almost everywhere. Um, and I think I don't want people to go too far down the line of going, oh, well, they're grey areas, so there's no difference, right? So, you know, they're, they're, there's black and there's white, there's grey, but there is black and white. So, uh, and and so you know, I I, don't, I think we can meaningfully talk about you know religion sometimes. You just have to be aware of the fact that we've got to be careful about where, where we draw those things. I think the other the curious point though is I think that a lot of the time this I, the idea that uh, lots of beliefs are kind of religious, even though the people who hold them don't think of them as being religious, is something that I think is an argument that's put forward a lot by people who are themselves religious because they kind of want to kind of say that you know don't 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 pick on us don't think of us as different you're religious too but the curious thing about that is that it tends to use as examples the kind of beliefs that we shouldn't really be having <laughs> yeah zeal beliefs without evidence etc etc so in, in a weird way it seems to be like saying oh there are far more religious beliefs out there because look at all these other silly beliefs people have <laughs> oops no and that's calling my own belief a bit silly but secondly i just think that you know i don't know why people want to do that it's like the, the faith idea when people sort of say you know well you, you believe that that's faith for you and they, they say there's faith outside the religious domain i don't know i i mean you know sophie sophie grace is a christian but I, I, I'm surprised more religious people don't kind of make the move that, yes, religious belief is special, faith is something special, and actually, yes, you can see grey areas and you can see places where uh, the, the difference between religious and non-religious isn't, isn't clear, but there's something distinctive and special about having a religious belief and living a religious life. And to say that, you know, you have faith in I don't know, alternative medicine, where you have faith in, in, in socialism or that your belief is kind of religious, is to actually detract from what's supposed to make it special. I think that um, this is a huge subject, but I think what I would say briefly is, first of all, that um, I think good definitions of most historical phenomena are historical, and they proceed by picking out paradigm cases of the phenomenon and working outwards towards the grey areas around those. And I, I absolutely agree that, for example, uh, the Catholic Church or um, Hinduism or Islam in its traditional form is a paradigm case of religion and unlike other things. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I don't disagree that there is something special about particular religions. Um, I think there are other beliefs. I, I, I do. I will stick to my guns and say I do think there are other beliefs which are like religious beliefs in the way that they're hold, held. And I'll also say that I do think that's a matter of the place in people's lives that those beliefs are given. And it's not a, a matter of whether they're, they're silly beliefs. Um, obviously, obviously, it's not that. Nor is it a matter of whether they're evidence-free beliefs. I mean, this is one I think of the 
best worn tropes and discussion about religious belief that it's it's not based on evidence. I, I don't think that's true. I think it is based on kinds of evidence. Um, but as I say, it's given a particular importance in people's life. But the, the most um, familiar representation in modern philosophical literature of the idea that religious belief is not based on evidence is, is Plantinga's idea of basic beliefs. Religion is basic belief. So you just start with this belief. It's epistemologically fundamental for you. So you have a general, um, you have a general view about um, epistemology that um, it's always foundationalist. It's always grounded on beliefs. You know, for every for every belief, there is a justification all the way down to the bottom, and then you get to foundation beliefs, which are not justified by anything below them. And the idea is you'd be in an infinite regress if you had to justify those foundation beliefs. So you can take planting it says whatever you like as your basic belief. And that's not irrational in itself. Um, it's just interesting to see what structures you build on top of it. Well, I, I completely disagree with Planting about this for a number of reasons. One of the big philosophical reasons is that I, I, I'm not a foundationist in that sense. One of the less than philosophical reasons is that I think this is a, a deep mis misrepresentation of what religious belief is like, precisely because it puts unevidenced beliefs at the bottom of everything. And I think that's, a, um, I th I think that's an important misrepresentation of what religious belief is like. Well, on that note, <laughs> let's um, leave things. That was a really interesting, really interesting discussion, um, but we better move on. So we'll see you in the next uh, part where we'll be shaking off the haters. And welcome back. There's a great deal of hate around at the moment, it seems. The recently proposed government policy around migrants and asylum seekers coming to the UK has been criticised itself and the language used around the policy has been criticised on the grounds that it vilifies vulnerable people. In the US this week, the state of Tennessee banned drag performance, riding on the coattails of a great deal of hatred and stirring up more in the process. There are plenty of other examples. The examples themselves are interesting. Philosophical issues are raised about migrants and nationhood and about the freedom of expression. But I'm also attracted to this phenomenon of hate. Why is there so much hatred around directed at minorities? And how do we take the heat out of this public debate? Um, any thoughts from either of you? Well, actually, I'll tell you what. I, I, you, you framed the question, why is there hatred towards uh, minorities? But I think there's hatred towards majorities as well. I mean, it's it, 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 it's it's <laughs> what's the phrase? You know, this is prejudice without prejudice, if you like. I mean, I think that the hatred towards so-called elites is really uh, very very strong. And in, in in all these kind of debates, you find the 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 level of vitriol on both sides is really high. Now, I'm not trying to claim equivalence. You know, the fact that you see bad things on two sides does not ever make do not necessarily make the two sides equivalent. And of course, people in minorities are simply in a position where they are having to put up with a hell of a lot more crap than, than other people and they have the real problems. But the hatred, I think, is just up on both sides. And I, I find it really depressing. And I, I think, you know, like there was this thing where people blamed everything on social media and then intelligent people learned to say, well, you know, it's more complicated than that and studies don't necessarily show. I've read a few things recently which make me think that actually a lot of people came around to the fact, you know what, a lot of it is to do with social media. And I, social media does seem to have this sort of capacity to give people licence and to encourage them to, to, to go more extreme. I mean, I do use Twitter for my sins and... You know, amongst people I follow, I don't really see a lot of this nonsense, but every now and again, too often probably, I click on what the trending topic is or something, and I'm invariably horrified, you know. And the point is that the, the level of kind of vitriol and demonization, no matter which side it is, you know, there are hashtags that are one side of a debate, there are hashtags that are the other side of the debate. Whichever one you click on that day, you'll find an almost equal quantity of you know just hatred um so it's not just directed towards my noise that the culture has become more more like this we had owen flanagan did a talk for the royal institute of philosophy last year and he he was saying that you know, anger he just he just sees it, that there's never known a time where there was more sort of anger 
in the world. So not just hatred, it's anger. It's those strong negative emotions. So I just wanted to broaden it out. I don't think it's just about towards minorities. It seems to be in all directions. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think um, that there are obvious actors that we can point to um, who are culpable for this kind of development. And I'll, I'll mention three. First of all, the press. Um, and not just the, you know, the what lefties like me think of as the obviously bad press, like the Express and the Mail. Not just them, but all newspapers have a tendency to polarise debate. And I'm not sure they even realise they're doing it, simply because, um, you know, I, I say, I get up in the morning and I say, I, I think everyone should be nice to everyone else. I think we should be kind. I think we should just be nice. That's not a news story. That's not clickbait. I get up in the morning and I think I, I think we should have an irrational, consuming hatred of people who wear size 11 shoes or, or some nonsense like that. And that's a story. Um, I think that the media are very responsible for platforming polarisation and for encouraging people to get more and more extreme in their positions because when they do, they're rewarded by getting a story in the press. I think that happens a lot. And there are, I mean, I, I'm not on Twitter anymore because I, I just found it too vile. Um, but I am on Facebook, and I subscribe to a couple of newspapers. One of them is the National, the Scottish pro-independence newspaper, and they're always bigging up the extreme positions, which are not positions that 98% of people in Scotland actually hold, whether they're um, unionists or independentists, they don't hold those views. And they're always platforming the extreme positions, and I, I think that's very dangerous. Um, I can understand why from a journalistic point of view, but I think it's a tendency they need to fight. The second agent I would name is leaders who encourage hatred and leaders who um, have a policy vacuum, except that they hate people. And this is people like Trump, DeSantis and the current government in Britain, um, all of which I think are guilty of trying to cover up uh, what is in other respects a policy vacuum. And the fact that they're not dealing with the real problems that we face, they cover up that by misdirecting our attention towards hating people. And in this case, I think, Julian, it is usually minorities. So obviously in America, Trump and DeSantis are currently running a transphobia auction for who's going to be the Republican candidate. And given that I'm a trans person, I find this pretty horrifying to watch. Um, which of us can be more extreme? Which of us can be more hateful towards trans people is, is basically what the Republican election, a uh, presidential election contest is currently about. That's horrifying to watch. And the third item that I would mention is that I think we underestimate the extent to which, and this is a conspiracy theory, forgive me for airing a conspiracy theory, but in this case, I think there really is such a conspiracy. I think we underestimate the extent to which uh, malign actors in Russia and China want democracies in the West to be filled with hatred and confusion and misinformation. They, we, we know for a fact that there are troll farms out there putting nonsense into social media, putting confusion and conspiracy theories and hatred onto social media. And I think we need to be a lot less naive about what's going on there. That really is happening. And I, I think I see it. I think I detect people who are, who are actually these, these trolls who are doing that. So three things to think about. Newspaper polarisation, hate-filled leaders, and the way that social media, I think, is being invaded by people whose motives are malign. And by trolls. Can, can I throw out something which I'm not entirely sure how, how far to go with this, but I think there's something to it. And I'm going to be very careful what I say here because uh, I do agree there is actually a lot of actual genuine hate out there. The the auction, the transphobia auction you're talking about amongst those particular candidates, I think I think is real, and I understand why that generates a lot of genuine fear in people, and just understandable and justifiable, because you know if one of these people were to be in power, that could be very very bad for for trans people. But I think. I do, I do have a sense that, that one sort of factor driving this is you know, what the inflation in kind of negative emotion is an increasing kind of, and, and, and so I'm, 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 I'm not going to say this, I'm, I'm not saying the snowflake thing, there's an increasing sort of assumption that people make that disagreement and criticism does equate to hatred. So I'll give you a few examples of this, which are fairly uncontroversial, I think. Kate Forbes, you mentioned Kate Forbes earlier, and you said, well, why is it she's the one who feels persecuted, you know? And that's a good question. 
But she kind of does. She has. She hears people being critical of her views, and it's like, oh, why does everyone hate me just because I'm a Christian? No, they don't hate you because you're a Christian. They disagree with you. Actually, a silly example was I wrote a pretty negative review of Jordan, a Jordan Peterson book. Um, who would have thought that? And um, he just tweeted something like, oh, Julie McGee obviously hates me. I thought, what a silly thing for a so-called intellectual to say. I didn't make a single ad hominem argument in the whole review. I don't know him. I've never met him. I don't obviously hate him at all. I just found his his book was awful. These are two different things. And I think that, yeah, these are sort of two little examples. But I think if you go across the board, you see a lot of cases where, you know, where, where people find them, their own views disagreed with, they're very quick to attribute sort of like hatred and negative emotion to the other side, rather than seeing it as being a point of, of disagreement. And that helps to kind of fuel the kind of emotional temperature as increase it. Because, you know, obviously, the moment you feel this person just does disagree with you, but they hate them, your own emotional reaction back to them is, is going to be stronger. You know, you think gloves come off. Um, you know, you, it's very hard to stay well disposed. So I think there's something to this. I'm not sure where it comes from or, or what to do about it. But I think there's something to this. Yeah, I, I think I think that's right. I think the human animal is always going to invest emotion even in what appear to be perfectly abstract debates i mean um I, you know there are famous stories about mathematicians getting immensely worked up with each other in seminars about you know whether whether this number has the following property or, or something completely abstract so we're always emotionally invested in what we care about and that can easily become too strong and inappropriate to the subject matter. And I'm sure it is an important role for philosophers to say, you know, calm down, stop getting so worked up, just remember what you're actually discussing here. And look, um, suppose you did make a mistake in your reasoning about this mathematical proof, um, if it's Andrew Wiles or something, suppose you did make a mistake in your, that, that doesn't, um, believe it or not, that doesn't mean that people who are pointing out this mistake hate you, and it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Um, but at the same time, of course, it's embarrassing to make mistakes. And this is certainly a thing that happens with reviews of philosophy books. And I, as a reviewer, when I was younger, I wrote some trenchant reviews, which I now regret, because I think that I was... And the thing that can happen with us is we become too anoraki and too focused just on the argument. And we forget the person behind the argument. So we write the stinging review, which um, you know demolishes the argument. And... Yes, it's inappropriate for the person who's on the receiving end of that to say, this this reviewer obviously hates me. But on the other hand, I as reviewer do have a duty to remember that there's a real human being there and that I can wound them deeply by things I might say about their books. And of course, I, I edit a philosophy journal and this comes up all the time. So um, actually coming back to privacy that we were discussing in the, in the first segment, um, there are exchanges between um, the editors of a journal. I'm in a position to tell you where one editor says to another, this article is just codswallop, isn't it? And just desk reject this. It's no good. And you don't want that exchange getting out because it's going to hurt people, precisely because it's true. Not because it's unfair criticism, but because it is fair criticism. I think all that's all that's true. And by the way, uh, generally speaking, I do try to be a very charitable uh, reviewer who, who thinks about the person behind it. But, you know, there are times where a book is just so bad and wrong in in a way that is pernicious that you just have to call it out and not pull your punches but yeah i, I think that's all true but 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 the, the point about attribute so so we have to be careful uh, how one speaks because it's understandable people will have an emotional reaction that's true but i think sometimes uh, you know people are um say attributing these these negative emotions to people where it's it's not necessarily their kind of fault um or you know to say that they should f foresee it in a sense yes in a sense no so let's take an example uh sort of attributed of xenophobia towards people who are against immigration right now the point is that there is a lot of xenophobia in the anti-immigration lobby that is undeniably true it's i think it's also the case though that not every single person who is in favor of of you know greater restrictions on immigration is straightforwardly xenophobic or let's you know and if you play the game of like saying oh we can always pick out you can always find the element of prejudice in there i mean we know we all of us have elements of prejudices in there you know you do the harvard implicit bias test slightly controversial i know but most people say there's something to it yeah you know, it's, it's not really you don't really get very far by sort of saying oh there's got to be a little bit of prejudice in there hasn't there well of course there's a little bit of prejudice in all of this 
Um, and I think the, the sort of the, the because in the political debates like that, the people on the on the you know the more liberal attitude to immigration side, which I put myself on, are so sort of quick to sort of like attribute these sort of like hateful emotions yeah. to people. It again increases the temperature. It doesn't help, but it also I think is counterproductive in the long run because actually you know yeah. when people feel they're being told they're racist, they they have this sort. Of, it's an irrational reaction from a, um, a philosophical point of view. But you know, if you're going to call me a racist anyway, no matter what I do, the the, the the accusation of racist doesn't matter to them as much anymore. They don't care so much about whether they're called racist or not, because as, as far as they're concerned, um, you know that that term's already applied to them. So it gives a bit of license for them to actually go even more in that direction. So I think it's really, really important that, and I don't know how we rode back from this, that we sort of don't do this thing of attributing these malicious uh, motivations to people we disagree with, even on things that are you know, really important to us, even when we think the consequences of this view would be really bad, you know, stepping back from that. But it's, it seems to be very difficult to do. It's easier, It's easier, I guess. It gives you an easier psychological model of the world simply to believe these views come from a place of hatred because then you've got this to engage of, with. A way of tying together um, these two issues is to talk about a book review of a book which was about immigration and I've just been engaging this week with Chandra and Kukathas' very interesting book, Immigration and Freedom. And there's a review of it by Stephen Macedo, if that's how you pronounce his surname, which is either about to appear in mind or has just appeared. Now, Kukathas' uh, thesis, uh, to which I'm very sympathetic, his thesis is blocking immigration, policing our borders, um, turning our society into a surveillance society to keep out the um, illegals. Um, as people like to call them, is really bad for the whole of society. We should stop policing our borders in this uh, in this extreme way because the results for everyone are increased surveillance, decreased liberty, and a kind of paranoia. That's Kukathas' thesis in Immigration and Freedom, and I'm very sympathetic to it. Macedo's review uh, says, um, well, um, the negative message that Kukathas is giving there, that we shouldn't do that stuff, that we shouldn't be, you know, Sivella Braverman in our attitudes, um, that's quite persuasive. But what about the positive side? How does Kukathas want things actually to go regarding immigration? Is he really saying that we should have unrestricted immigration? Is he really saying that we should just let people travel around? And Kukathas is um, a libertarian right winger. Kukathas' view is that uh, we should have a free market in labour, just as we have a free market of money. You know, money can travel around. Why can't people? That's basically his view. And he thinks global capitalism should embrace unrestricted immigration. But Macedo's reply to that is, oh, this wouldn't work in practice. And uh, Kukathas underestimates the degree of uh, disorder that this would cause because people so strongly object to immigration. Now, what Macedo is saying there, it seems to me, is dubious in the following way. There's a thing that happens in philosophy where we get on the outside of an attitude. And instead of taking the attitude from the inside, we say, well, people have this reaction and we have to factor that in. So, you know, consequentialists can't see some anything wrong with some horrendous practice like capital, like uh, cannibalism, let's say. I nearly said capitalism there, which perhaps is arguably an even more horrendous practice. Anyway, let's say it's, cap it's cannibalism. And the rule consequent, sorry, the, the extreme act consequentialist can't see anything wrong with cannibalism from the inside. They say, oh, but it has bad effects on people's feelings, and we have to take that into account. Um, so you externalise the objection because you can't get inside it because your moral theory won't let you get inside it. And then you're just being, I think, you're just being buffeted about by whatever people happen to think in a way that you shouldn't be. And I think that's happening to Macedo here. I think Macedo is, in effect, saying, oh, Kukathas ideas... They're very nice, but they wouldn't work in practice because so many people in society are racist. And I think that's a dodgy thing to say. I think, I mean, we, we come back to ideal uh, participants in, in, in public reason here versus actual participants in public reason. In an interesting way, um, I, I want to go beyond what Macedo is saying. And I think I, I would say something like, well, you know, maybe we should have a debate about this. Maybe we should talk publicly about why. People think migration is such a bad thing. And why actually migration might be a really good thing. After all, there are societies which are completely built upon migration. The US for a start. Why do we have such a problem with the idea of open borders? I, I think, think the idea, is, yes. I mean, I think the idea of taking people's kind of effective reactions as, as given and sort of set in stone is 
is, is extremely uh, dubious um, just for psychological yeah. reasons. For a start, it's bad psychology because what we find is yes. that these things are much, much more plastic than you might think. Attitudes to immigration are a very, very good example because you can look in the history of the last recent decades and you'll find they're far from uniform. Um, it depends on so many things. You know, it depends upon uh, what support is given, where the people are from. Unfortunately, that may be a sort of a racist motive, but um, w- you know, whether it's evident that people are uh, not being given resources that would be going to local people, whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, the idea that these these reactions are, are simply given and, and, and it's, it's far too pessimistic. I mean, uh, let's take, let's say we're taking those attitudes around LGBT. BTQ rights. I mean, it was undeniably the case that not so long ago, public attitudes were very poor in the United States. But let's take these ISIS examples, the change there has been very strong. And although there's still a lot of that kind of right wing bigotry, sort of fundamentalist Christian bigotry, attitudes have changed enormously and there are now leading politicians and et cetera, et cetera. Attitudes have changed just because people's experience have changed. Uh, mainly, they've got to know people, and guess what? They're they're not they're not out there to sort of like, you know pervert your children. Um, so yeah, yeah, we shouldn't just be sort of taking these attitudes as as given. But again, this is this is perhaps this is a, 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 perhaps even a better way of or a development of the point that you know whenever you engage with people with a simplistic attitude of what their moral and emotional life is like you're in trouble you know people people yeah. are more complicated than that and you've got to allow for that and yeah the temptation to sort of act as though it's simple and just given is, is very very strong there's there's a lovely bit in the crito where socrates says to to crito oh you know that that's the opinion of the the mob and i don't need to take any uh, cognizance at all i don't need to pay any attention at all to the opinions of the mob and Crito replies, well, the opinions of the mob got you in prison, didn't they? And you're, you're here now because of the opinions of the mob, so maybe you should pay a bit of attention to them. And I, I think we face exactly, it's a, a kind of, it's, a, it's almost a joke, it's certainly a witty line in Plato, and I think we face that kind of bipolarity about other people's opinions all the time. So, I mean, the, the Blair government was, I think, prescient about the kinds of racism and bigotry that were bubbling under and that were later expressed by people like Nigel Farage. And at the time, it was the Countryside Alliance and a lot of people who were worried about replacement effects. You know, this this, this alleged, um, this allegation that people make, and Macedon makes it in his Rukukovas, that letting in lots of migrants will mean that um, indigenous workers are replaced by the migrants. And as a matter of economic theory, that simply isn't true. That's not what happens. What the migrants do is they create new businesses. They stimulate economic activity. But anyway, there there are such myths. And when you're in power, um, in actually in power, you do face a very difficult problem of triangulating the ideal with the actual. You know, the ideal is, you. you let's say you, you've done enough economic theory to know darn well that lots of migrants will not replace the the current workers. I mean, and look at the horrible situation we're in with the shortage of workers in the UK now because of Brexit and because of our hostility to migrants. We're in a real mess because of this idea of replacement. But you have to triangulate between knowing darn well that there is no such problem, actually, and the fact that people out there in society believe that there is this problem. And all the time, the press is amplifying the idea that there's such a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's and a very difficult really, thing to do. And I, I think in fairness to politicians, we should recognise how hard it is to do that. Yeah, and that's what it is to be a leader, I think. Um, I mean, so just to summarise some thoughts from me. So I think the way to combat hatred is is kindness, but also quite a lot of patience and a lot of understanding and uh, an explanation and dialogue with people. Um, although I can't help but think, just to add a little bit of grit into this conversation, that occasionally it is justified and in practice necessary to fight fire with fire um oh yeah i mean i think that is true i mean maisha cherry has wrote a book done very well called the case for rage and uh alessandra tanasini has sort of made similar kind of arguments yeah that there is this danger that the the the, the demand please be civil is actually sometimes a way for the people who have the power to put the people who are understandably uh livid about it in their place so yes there are times where these calls for civility are inappropriate and there are times where it's absolutely right to scream and shout etc 
but um, but clearly uh, the balance isn't correct in our current uh, social situation. Yeah. Right, listen, let's um, uh, draw things to a close uh, there, but with a kind of positive outlook. So as I said at the start of the programme, uh, this week saw International Women's Day. And uh, so the three of us nominate one inspiring woman. Uh, just say a little bit about her. Uh, who wants to go first? Well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, Nicola Sturgeon, I think, um, with Jacinta Ardern, um, in in pole position just behind her. I think she's been um, a beacon of hope and positivity in a very difficult situation. Um, the only thing, the biggest thing Nicola Sturgeon ever did wrong, in my view, was resign. I wish she hadn't done that. Well, actually, I was going to nominate Jane Goodall, uh, the famous primatologist. And I think there's so many reasons for this. I mean, she got involved in the field of primatology at the time where it was entirely sort of male dominated. And not only that, you know, she was interested in, you know, the the emotional and social lives of the primates. And at the time, this may or may not be related to the fact it was very, very male dominated. They had a very kind of reductive, uh, dry approach to this. And they thought it just simply wasn't scientific to even do this. So she really pushed the boundaries or she pushed that she expanded people's conception of what a scientific approach to other animals is in a way that had a really sort of fight against those forces. And, and you know, her whole life since has been absolutely extraordinary and she's become a massive campaigner for environmental protection. So I think she's an, a completely amazing woman. Great. And uh, I was going to nominate uh, Isabel Oakshot, but uh, <laughs> I don't think... I don't think I will. So if I'm going to pick someone from uh, history, um, uh, her name is Mary Lacey, L-A-C-Y, um, 1740 to 1801. And there's one reason I, I pick her, because she was raised in the village where I live in, in Kent in Ash. Um, but uh, the particular thing that she's known for is, well, she, she's often referred to as the female shipwright. Um, and she's arguably the first person uh, ever to sit an exam and be given a pension uh, by the British uh, Admiralty uh, as a female um, shipwright. Um, and in fact, so she she travelled, uh, you know, left home when she was very young. She actually had to disguise herself as a man to get on board a ship, to be apprenticed to a ship's carpenter. And then she sat an exam as a shipwright, did a huge amount of shipbuilding work, was acknowledged to be one of the best shipwrights around at the time. Uh, and then uh, eventually she revealed herself to be a woman and she managed to secure a pension under her name of Mary Lacey, which is uh, quite amazing. So well worth looking up uh, her inspiring story, which would have been very, very difficult to do all those things at the time. Um, right, we should draw things to a close there. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Julian. Thanks for coming on again, Julian. Thanks, Simon. Lovely as usual. And Sophie Grace, thanks for coming on to you as well. Very enjoyable. Thank you, Simon. And thanks to you for listening. Hope you can join us again for another Philosophy Takes on the News. Music